Hello, and welcome to Association Transformation. I am really excited about this week. It, it speaks to my association roots, and it also takes us back to our traditional transatlantic conversation. So welcome to my co-host, Andrew Chamberlain of Consort Strategies. I'm Elisa Pratt with Brewer Pratt Solutions, and we are excited to welcome you to our ongoing and evolving conversation of everything associations we are we're seeking a diversity of thought we want to bring new people to the table we want to have bleeding edge conversations about what is working and what is not working in the association and nonprofit space and today we are going to take on the topic of all topics with an american guest and a guest from the uk and that is membership so today we are excited to welcome Kim Hall, the Director of Membership for the National Association of Counties, and David D'Souza, Director of Membership with the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development. So membership, if, if anything was disrupted in these last 12 months, it's membership. And between a new value proposition, um, having to take renewals more seriously, those can't be taken for granted anymore, and, and an urgency of redefining the membership experience I'm excited to kind of ask each of you, maybe we, we start with what was what was the greatest membership struggle of of last year? You know, what what are you coming into 2021 facing as it relates to membership? And ladies first, maybe I'll kick off with Kim. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Wow, what happened in 2020? Holy cow. Um, after I think we recovered. <laughs> I know that's a lot of any shock. Right. At, well, and and Interestingly, we had just, we were just in the end of our legislative conference, was, which is always in Washington, D.C. in person, and it just started to happen. So we were actually pretty lucky. But after you get over the shock that the world has changed so dramatically, um, and especially since our membership has always been very focused on interactions, live interactions, we have many conferences throughout the year. And then my team of two traveled to state association conferences across the country um, to promote membership. So it was a real eye opener to have to pivot to virtual. And our audience uh, as counties aren't always the most tech savvy. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. Uh, you've got, you know, what large percentage of counties in the country are rural. And so you go in, it wakens you up to the lack of broadband, even though that's been a primary initiative of us, it certainly rose much more to the top after COVID hit. Um, and so how do you redefine the relationship selling that you've been doing? So that is, that is what happened for us in 2020. I'm happy to say we did pivot quite well, but I'll finish my comment with that. So what were the numbers? I mean, I, Andrew's a data guy. I'm surprised he's not jumping all over the numbers. What uh, what did the year end at? Were you at your normal retention numbers? Did you see a drop? Actually, <laughs> remarkably, no, we saw an increase. Um, our retention rate at this association, since my arrival anyway, uh, it was always high, 97%, but now it's 99%. And that's staggering to me. And we're at all time membership highs. Um, for the last two years, we've had, we've had record low cancellations. Historically, they were around 50. Now they're around 30. So that was pretty remarkable to me. And so all no, since our Kim numbers has arrived. Didn't... Let's rem remember, all since Kim has arrived. So that was a perfect, <laughs> perfect self promotional plug in the del most delicate of way. I love it. But I actually, it. you know, I did work that in, but it's true. <laughs> It, it really wasn't that delicate, if I'm honest. It was, it was, it was about as subtle as a sledgehammer. That was, you know, I just want to say, since I started, it's now almost 100%. I mean, it's, I'm not going to say 100, I'm going to say 99.5%. <laughs> because of me. Well, actually, you've said it's such a. But it is interesting because, and it just goes to show, you know, how change in an organization is sometimes important and with all due respect to my predecessor he brought us to where we were but he'd been here for 20 years and the world changed and when you've been so embedded in a way of thinking for so long 
it, it, it's an opportunity for you to find a new challenge. And then for the new person, it's an opportunity to rethink because you're not bound by the structure that that former uh, person had. So it created a new day for NACO in general, just to have a different membership team. And it was led by the woman who hired me. She was a former NACO president. <clears throat> Excuse me, she knew NACO very well. And so I just was part of the equation of the shift. That's great. Well, it sounds like last year brought a lot of silver linings and positives, you know, whether they were planned for or you were just kind of thrown into it. It, it sounds like you're you're almost in a better place because of it. And you've now set a very high bar for David. I mean, now we are. <laughs> I want to hear David. from David. How are things going? What you know, what retention numbers are you at? No pressure. Yeah, no, I, since, <laughs> since I started, we've actually, yeah. Since, since I you've arrived, with, right. Yeah. Only since you've arrived. <laughs> yeah. since, since, I, since I arrived, we've retained 110% of our members. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd say Kim looks quite amateurish at this point in our fans. But, um, no, uh, obviously, we're, we're 107 years old and we've been doing, we've been evolving. Uh, but last year was um, completely different for the organization because it was completely different for our members. So uh, we do our renewals each year, April, May time, uh, and then it kind of stretches out from then. And obviously, as we were coming into that period, we were incredibly nervous about the impact economically um, and in terms of welfare on our members, but then the knock on impact of that on our organization. And I would say that we worked as an organization harder than ever before to get results that were static. That was slightly better in terms of our membership growth. So that was an excellent headline, but we had um, a percentage of our members go onto a hardship register, which we made available to them. But we were making decisions at a speed that we probably weren't used to, executing at a speed that we weren't used to, having to respond with materials to support people in a way that we weren't used to. And it's our job now to make sure that we keep that pace to keep supporting people. Because all you ever do as an organization is meet a need in the world. I think sometimes we kind of overcook in terms of the strategic descriptors. There's a need that people have, you meet it. If you do it well enough, you deserve to keep existing. And we met that need really well. So our, our biggest kind of swing was in Net Promoter School and our schools around sentiment and relevance because they, they shot through the roof in the last year. We've got to keep that standard going forward. So it was a horrible year for people probably a good year for us to prove our worth um, and we face the same challenges around our event strategy and our connection strategy and communication um, but actually it's, it's driven us to I think some far better practices and driven us into a space where we're supporting our members better than ever. I totally agree with that as well. Um, yeah I think it's interesting that um... Yeah, it really did for it really I feel a lot. I mean, we spent a lot of time at least and I talking with um colleagues across the sector and the, the, the way people have managed to focus um and and almost um given themselves permission to to acknowledge what does and doesn't work and and to and to stop doing, you know, what what isn't working, you know. And I'm curious to hear David, you know, you said you you know you you've improved um you know some of your systems and your processes and the and the and ultimately i would assume the offering to the member i mean i'm just curious as to what that you know can you give an example of, of what that looks like yeah I, th I think one of the things that we did really early was we um we recognized that for a lot of our members they were going through a very difficult time at home or with bereavement with the impact of this economically so we introduced a, a well-being area and a, a direct well-being helpline for them to use as a, as a service and support. Now, what I would say is that previously that would have probably taken six to nine months to put in, or you might have got nine months into it and it would have drifted into the next financial year. We made that business case and that decision within about a fortnight and I think launched within three weeks. Um, now, I don't think we'll always be able to keep going at that pace, but that's a really good example of us just being able to go, here's a problem, we'll solve it. The same with our, our quick response uh, pieces. We used to kind of primarily go out to media. So there might be a call, there's been a, 
you know, there's an issue in, in the press, what can you do about it? With all of our COVID response, that was providing our members with best practice guidance or good practice guidance, sometimes within an hour, sometimes with three or four changes being made in a day um, because of the way that policy was, was kind of delivered here, prim primarily in the UK, uh, but also more broadly. So that pace was unique to us, I think, but also so was the ability to go, look, we've done it this way for 50 years, but it isn't going to work this year. We changed all of our marketing and all of our communications for renewals, which had probably been pretty much the same for at least 10 or 15 years, ripped it all up and started again. And when, what do we want? What do we want people to hear from us now? What do they want to know from us? And actually, how supportive can we be in this period rather than please, can we have your money, please? Um, so it was a really different <laughs> approach. Um, and, and the organisation really wasn't used to it. So there were quite a few meetings where people were, but you can't do that. And it's like, well, actually, we have to. The world's changed. We have to change. There is no way that you get to stay the same and get a different result. You know, it's so interesting. You use the term overcooked. And I think a lot of, you know, with me this membership sales, mission-driven organisations, a lot of things associations do can become overcooked overthought and drawn out. And this last year forced us into agility. And the organizations that have survived and are striving are those who are handling this emergency crisis triage. They're able to triage in uh, uh, an efficient and effective way, cutting away all that's unnecessary. And you know, this chance, that net promoter score that you mentioned and increasing relevance, this really has been an opportunity for organizations to increase relevance when members need them most in areas they may not have previously been serving. I'm wondering when when some of this falls away, will you go back to your normal membership model? Will will these things stay on? Um, what what does the new normal of member benefits look like? Are you going hybrid? Are you, are you going to give them everything that you've now created plus the old? Or does it have to be a streamed down sustainable menu of services? <laughs> exactly. Sorry, I didn't, exactly. I, I, I didn't know whether that was to me or Kim. Right. I can answer right. from our point of view, but I, but I don't want Go to ahead. dominate Go the ahead. conversation. Again. So um, I'll dominate after you're done. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been a really good trigger for us to be better. It's been a trigger for us to get closer to our members' need, and I think I would hate for us to lose that ability. We've also been able to work with larger organisations more effectively in the government. We need to keep those connections. There's no reason it shouldn't be better. Um, I guess one of my narratives or one of the things that I get concerned about with the membership sector as a whole is quite often you see some quite inward looking work. So people will think because a slide deck's been produced or because they've had a great meeting that that's good work. It's not. When it hits the outside world, that's the only time you're making a difference. And I think we've got better at appreciating that unless it's making a difference outside of what would have been our headquarters, but now is, you know, people's bedrooms, bathrooms, kitchens, and wherever they're working, unless it's making a difference in the outside world, it's just noise. Um, and if we can cut through that, and it doesn't mean you don't have a strategic plan, so you can have an overview of where you want to get, but you understand that talking about that plan isn't moving you forward. It's the difference you make for people that changes the way they think about you, where they'll be advocates for you, and ultimately the change that they can make. So Kim, we're not slipping you... back. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's really good to slip in back. Yeah, Kim, you, you, you know, is that reflecting in where you're at as well? Yes. So first of all, David, thank you for defining Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize Fortnite was three weeks. <laughs> I didn't have I to Google that. Weeks. I don't know. He said three. Didn't you say? Three? I only I know because probably, of Wimbledon. Uh, I, I only said know probably, because of Wimbledon. probably two or three weeks. I mean, we, we have been quite progressive this year, but I don't think I've I don't <laughs> think I've, I've redefined a fortnight. <laughs> We've that's, if that's, that far, yeah. <laughs> it feels like disruption, doesn't it? Maybe I will. Yeah, <laughs> three week fortnight coming to you live. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Glad I said something. I would have thought a fortnight was three weeks. Okay. Anyway, you know, it's interesting with, with NACO. Um, there were some things that were already in motion, put in motion by our senior leadership team, our executive director, that have really um, created that whole Jim Collins flywheel effect, you know, from his book, Good to Great. Because prior to COVID, um, we had organizationally, we had done really three things. Make membership engagement our number one goal and promote that very widely to our, our uh, uh, board of directors and others. 
focusing on cross-department collaboration. And that's part of where I came in at that time. That's what I do. I don't even know how people can work without collaborating. And then leveraging, we have an engagement index. And so we were already working on some of these things. And I guess the fourth one from a marketing perspective is, um, I've always believed people do business with people. And especially when you're in a Washington DC based organization and a large percentage of your membership are rural counties, they hear DC and it conjures up images that you cannot control. <laughs> um, so instead of talking about and positioning NACO from advocacy, leadership opportunities, you know, networking, access, all these things, we actually, and I'd hired a marketing firm in December the year prior to do some uh, research and shift us from this whole fact-based messaging to a people-first approach. And it's now under the guise of my, my county, my NACO. And so we're telling the NACO story now from the membership perspective. And we've totally redone our marketing materials and it's all member, it's loaded with member quotes and, and pictures because that's what people will relate to differently. And that was actually in motion before COVID, but with COVID, it's mattered even more because it's one thing to have a talking head in DC to, to you know, spew the benefits of NACO, but when you've got very well-respected leaders across the country from counties saying how it impacts them, that just has a different, different uh, impact. So interesting for us that we were already had so many things in motion that have just helped propel us into a better place. Tell me about the engagement index. I haven't heard it in, you know, in those terms. I mean, engagement score or things like that. What is, what is that meant? How did you guys build that? So we have a very savvy tech team, thankfully, and they created this within um, D365. And so it, it captures engagement um, in different categories. Uh, and it's a county score, but it's a combination of county engagement and then individual county member engagement. And it measures things like, and it has uh, scores accordingly. So are you a member or not? <laughs> um, do you participate <laughs> you get in any of our- <laughs> <laughs> But you do. You do, you do, yeah. because we do capture, we have non-members that are engaged with us. And so um, those become our prospects, right? Um, but it's events, it's committee engagement. Are you in a leadership role? Do you participate in any of our programs? What about our webinars? And so we capture this data and a new evolution for this engagement index um, is that we can also now see the number of people in a county that are engaged. So the top score is 300 for a county right now. And so then if you've got counties that have 10 as their score, you've got a problem. <laughs> and so it's enabled us to really focus our efforts um, because it's 3,069 counties, boroughs and parishes in, in the country. We do have 78% of those uh, as members, but if you don't get smart about how you're marketing to them, and if you don't know your audience, um, then you can't be as effective and frankly, it can be a little overwhelming. So we have it categorized by county size, uh, all kinds of demographic information, and then you can filter, it's a filter system too. So you can filter by state, uh, by member, non-member, county size, and then a whole range of other engagement scores. So so with that human focus, cool. if you're focusing on the member narrative and you're focused on engagement, is that is the money and the, the retention numbers becoming less important because you can show there's higher engagement? You may not have 99% next year, but if your engagement scores are higher, I mean, what is your leadership really measuring membership success by then? It's uh, a good question. I think the expectation is around all of the above. Uh, <laughs> Everything they actually, and more. Right? They, they, well, yeah. They actually budgeted a 5% decrease in membership. 
And the best way for me to light a fire under me is to tell me I can't do something. <laughs> so, but but it it really has very little to do with me, frankly. I wish it did. Um, but so it it is about the money, uh, the the and the numbers. Um, but it what also is important is that we are increasing those engagement scores. But we haven't quantified what that really looks like yet, and we're in the process of doing that. Um, but it's right now it's all budget and the numbers. So our number one membership engagement's number one priority, but it's also reaching a new membership high, and that's mm. the, one of the bigger emphasis. So, but is that is that? Are you using that data then to? Are you internally when you're then talking? You know, going back to the point about what David was saying earlier. Unless, unless it's you know, unless it's externally focused, it's just noise. Unless you know what's going on inside isn't necessarily you know uh, determining what we deliver outside. But um, if you is that data then just being used to enhance general awareness of the organisation? Is it a Marcoms tool, or are you actually developing? different membership services and different member opportunities to respond to those that lack of engagement or the opportunities for further engagement that's a great question and it's really a, a tool for us to fine-tune our marketing outreach um, and our programs have been evolving but not necessarily on not yet it's a, a newer tool for us and i think as we get more used to using it we will we will um, evolve the way we use it, right? Uh, but right now, one example is um, if so, we have a whole foundation side, and they we work with very um, uh, large foundations to do initiatives like you know um, counties with kids or work future of workforce, and we have all these initiatives, and so that means that our staff reach out to different county leaders across the country. And so the difference in the past was that they would just reach out and reach out. And I would never know if they were talking to a non-member, I wouldn't know any of it. So now what's cool is through the e-index, we can, we can understand what counties are at risk. And then when they talk to membership, we can, and we've provided them with the prospect list so they can reach out to prospects and then leverage that engagement to increase engagement or secure a new member. So right now that's, and, and it's also forcing my team in a good way to fine tune how we message. Um, we're getting more sophisticated um, in how we're able to target our, our marketing. Um, yeah. But I'm happy with the first couple steps already well i mean That's yeah absolutely awesome. you can't absolutely you can't do everything all at once all the time absolutely but you know david in a in a ci in a cipd context you know you mentioned net promoter scoring and um, is that is that your way of measuring engagement or is that your way of developing services i mean what do you um what's your approach on that yeah we, we don't tend to use uh, net promoter score i guess as a design tool it's more of a broader sentiment measure for the organization so we can see whether we're heading in the right direction we've got a, a depth of resources surveys checkpoints panels that tell us whether we're meeting uh, the need of our members because you only really do two things you serve a profession and you lead it in our position and actually yeah. your permission to lead it is determined on how well you serve it so mm -hmm. we're constantly reviewing that proposition everything from to what extent our members voice is heard right through to actually of the 50 benefits that we have how many people know about each one what's their satisfaction with it and how many people use each one and we've been using that over the last few years to continually refine what we're offering to make sure that it's the best value for them how do you are you an individual membership and an organizational uh, we do both so primarily individual in terms of membership but we work with large corporates um, on a partnership basis to professionalize their functions uh, and to involve their people. And increasingly what we're trying to do is bring those two things together. So whether you, to your point around um, engagement, we're looking at our, the breadth of our ecosystem, which includes policymakers, senior stakeholders, organizations, people who might come to us for a learning event and nothing else. 
how can we make sure that people are getting what they need from us in the right way but equally for the ones that might want stronger relationships with us how can we bring them into that kind of membership sphere either as organizations or individuals to make sure that we're influencing and supporting in the best way that we can so last year may be the beginning of this new membership reality not only how we engage how we quantify value how we strive for relevance but you know, I, I want to be forward thinking. I don't want to just commiserate about 2020 forever. You know, we, we have to now harness we'll the future and define we'll the future. We'll have 2021 to commiserate about exactly. soon. So, you know, we're going to start moving on. already letting us down. So, <laughs> but, you know, what what is your main goal for 2021? Based on what you've learned, what you've been through, and what you now see your organization to be capable of, mm. what's your number one membership goal for 2021? Start with Kim. Hot seat, Kim, you're up. Um, really, frankly, to to deepen the work we're already doing, um, it's working um, remarkably. Um, I think because of the organizational emphasis on membership engagement, the caliber of what we deliver is astounding. Um, we have relationships because our focus is national. We have relationships with all the federal agencies. We have biweekly phone calls with the White House on COVID. Um, so it's the value is there. And now what's exciting is we've got several what we call NACO advocates who we are looking to support our outreach efforts and to deepen that because it's a team of two for membership. Mm -hmm. And that's a heavy lift. So it's it's enhancing that and it, effort. And it's great coming off such a, such a uh, huge amount of disruption, you know, continuing the change, continuing the improvements is great. Uh, you know, you just get scared because five years go by, 10 years go by, and all of a sudden you're you're protecting the new status quo. Well, right. And and I don't think I don't think our members will let us do that. Um and and the NACO advocate bit has been way more effective. Matter of fact, last week we got three new members and wow. it was big and we'll get more this week because we have leaders on our board or our state association partners that have sent out messaging around the value of what we offer. And that's way more impactful than mm -hmm. me or anyone from NACO talking about it. So mm -hmm. I think that will just deepen and continue. Yeah. Well, you know, I want to say there, you guys are in very unique situations, privileged, if you will, because you have dedicated membership departments, That's dedicated membership professionals. So you're doing amazing things. And, you know, there's a lot of organizations that, you know, rely on membership being everyone's job. And we know how, how well that goes. But David, what is your, what's your 2021 goal? What do you believe your organization capable of in the membership space this year? You're coming up on renewals. You said April, May. Yeah, so the challenge I sent la set last year for the team was because we didn't know what would happen economically in the challenge, was to not focus on that, but to focus on being the very best that we could. So put yourself in the mm -hmm. best possible position to provide the best possible service and value and communicate that well. And then actually the external environment will dictate what happens beyond that. So Amazon have got a lovely kind of day one philosophy they talk about, which is every day is kind of almost resetting the organization are we heading in the right direction? Are we doing the right things and obsessing around customers? We need to carry that on into next year because I think that's how you get sustained success because your business model then becomes as flexible as it needs to be because you're focused on those needs. So that is the one thing that I hope we keep going. So I don't know how the UK economy, how the worldwide economy, because we've got over 10,000 members worldwide, 150,000 in the UK. I don't know how that will play out in terms of numbers. What I do know is that my expectation of the team is that we keep the standards up there and don't use the external economic environment as, a, as an excuse to decline. We make sure that we're doing absolutely everything that we can, and then we see the outcome of that, and then we keep on working to the method in the right way, to the model, to try and keep things driving in future years. Well, you're right. If we haven't learned anything, it's to not not forecast out too far, not well, uh, right. not try to uh, to be anything more than the economy and the membership will will allow us to be. So this is an ongoing conversation. I would love to have you both back at the end of the year or this time next year just to see how things went. 
Um, it's, it's impressive what your organizations have accomplished and how you've weathered this storm and, and even become stronger. So congratulations to both of you for that. Your organizations are, are lucky to have each of you. Mm -hmm. um, and we really thank you for joining us on uh, Association Transformation. With that, I will thank everyone for joining us. Andrew, thanks for, for joining us this morning. We are excited to, to make sure that membership and recruitment and retention aren't put on a back burner. They mm -hmm. can't be forgotten about. And I think last year showed us they can't be taken for granted any longer. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll continue this conversation. We'll continue holding the industry accountable to uh, membership best practices and, uh, and prioritizing the member experience. So we welcome you back. Uh, hope you've enjoyed this podcast. If there's a subject you would like us to explore, or you have an idea for our next conversation, you can tweet us at Association Transformation or email us hello at yourconsort.com and we'll draw on you, your expertise and our networks to put together a podcast worth listening to. I think, Izzy, aren't we about at every, we're at every podcast platform these days. I mean, wherever you find your podcast, you can find Association Transformation and we hope you'll make us one of your favorites. Until next time, we say stay well and put your members and your mission first. Association Transformation is brought to you in partnership between Consult Strategy and Brewer Pratt Solutions in support of the Institute of Association Leadership.